and good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be back to in-person conferences. I forgot about the blazing lights and everything associated with this world, but it's great to be here. Um, as, as Noah mentioned, I wear two hats these days. Uh, I'm a longtime faculty member in uh, Princeton in the computer science department, uh, where I've worked on different architecture topics with a little bit of systems thrown in um, over the years. If you are an academic computer science researcher in the US, you probably have gotten funding from NSF. You almost certainly have gotten funding from NSF. And so as is not uncommon at NSF, people do what are called rotations in to serve on the other side, to go into NSF and to serve the research community um, by stewarding the research process at this government agency. And so I started that rotation. It's a four year term to go to NSF. I started in February, 2020. Uh, that's a very interesting time to start a new job. I had five weeks in person before everything went uh, down the path that you know about. Um, and so I'm speaking today with my NSF hat on, um, but I'm also speaking with the experiences of someone who's been able to work on, as Noah mentioned, power efficient computing and zebra tracking and quantum computing. And I think if you have any questions as young students out there, if you have any questions about why do an academic career, I would say that there's no company that would have funded me to do all three of those things um, to the degree of mixing that I was able to do. And so I'm grateful to NSF for the funding that let that mixing happen. Uh, so NSF is a US government agency. Um, it was founded in the aftermath of World War II. Um, America was not a tech uh, powerhouse 100 years ago, um, but in the early part of the 20th century, uh, America did sort of grow in its science and technology capabilities. And the idea of the NSF was to sort of come out of World War II and say, how can we use these capabilities for the best good? And so the mission statement of NSF is what you see here, to promote the progress of science first and foremost, and then to advance on different societal benefits. Um, and this is our building in Alexandria, Virginia, which we're back to, we were fully virtual for over a year. Uh, we're back to, in person to some degree and more in person. If you do review panels for us, thank you. And most of those are staying virtual for a little while longer. Uh, so this is NSF as a whole. Um, when I think about what these mission statements mean to me, uh, I often think about it using this analogy. So here's a tree. This tree is in my backyard, in my home in New Jersey. My husband and I love this tree. We have no idea who planted it. And actually a lot of different cultures have this notion of one generation planting the tree so that subsequent generations can benefit from it, from the shade, from the beauty, uh, from the oxygen and so forth. Um, and research is like that too, right? When you have an idea of a project and you start it, or when you sit down and first have that first discussion with a student, or a collaborator about uh, some work you want to start, or when you write a proposal and send it to a funding agency, or, or come up with a pitch and pitch someone for funding, those are all examples of planting trees. And so when NSF uh, and other funding agencies think about what to fund, really what we're doing is we're thinking about where would it best benefit society for us to have more trees planted, and how can we uh, sort of cultivate the right mix of trees uh, maybe planting some from acorns and some that are a little more mature from the start and so forth to create the best benefits. And so I usually start with this and then I talk about different, what I've come to call tree stories of NSF impacts through this process. Um, and my tree story today is actually three in one. Uh, so on the left, there are foundational impacts that NSF and the directorate that I lead, the Computer and Information Science and Engineering Directorate, have brought to the world. So that picture on the far left is, uh, was in the news about a month ago, right? That is the recently imaged black hole of Sag A star uh, within our own Milky Way galaxy. And some folks might look at that and see astronomy, uh, but come on, this is a computing audience. And so you guys, I hope, look at this and see computing uh, because tens of millions of CPU hours led to this picture being at the resolution it is, but even more so, uh, incredible computational photography algorithms, Bayesian inferencing algorithms, led to the resolution in this picture. And if you go back and watch 
the uh, press conference from when this was announced about six weeks ago now, uh, you'll see that the third of the four speakers that were on the panel for that press conference was uh, an early career pre-tenure Caltech professor, and size gave her her career award uh, last year, Katie Bauman, for her work on computational imaging. Uh, so we're proud of the way that we have founded, is, that we have funded fundamental work in how information is gathered, analyzed, and communicated. We're proud of the fact that 60% of the Turing Award winners in the history of the Turing Award winner have received NSF funding. Second one is about translational um, impact. And I don't expect you to be able to read that middle diagram, but if you're curious about that middle diagram, the URL for it is in the lower right corner of the screen. It's from a National Academies study. Uh, so over the past 20 years, the National Academies has periodically done something that's come to be called the tire tracks diagram uh, that maps from different foundational CS topic areas, like systems, like architecture, like AI, and so forth, maps the timelines of different seminal results and their impacts on the world. And so the left-hand side of this diagram are the different topic areas that I mentioned, and those things that have come to be called tire tracks are horizontal timelines of from the 60s to the present. What are seminal results and how do they interconnect? You can see swooping arrows that go back and forth, showing how one field picked up on work that another one did. Um, when you get to the middle of the diagram, you're talking about how those impacts were then taken up by the companies, many of whom are in the room, that actually take from the research space and, and put it out into the product space. So those are the Apples, the Qualcomms, and so forth. Uh, the interesting thing about this newest version of the tire tracks diagram, and it, it's called the tire tracks diagram because of those uh, things on the left-hand side that do look like skid marks, right? Uh, the interesting thing about this newest version, it gets updated every four years, this is the 2020 update, uh, is the right-hand side of this, which looks more subway map than tire tracks at this point. That subway map is showing how different ideas from many different parts of our community intertwine and then go out and shape uh, economic and societal sectors very far from what we traditionally call information technology. Uh, so this is when folks from Deer, the tractor folks, come and say, actually, um, data and information is dramatically reshaping agriculture, or folks from health uh, companies, uh, or automotive companies, or entertainment companies, Disney, NFL, come and say to the National Academies, IT research has dramatically transformed us as well. So by the time you get to the right-hand side of this diagram, you're talking about, whoops, a trillion dollars of impact uh, on the world. Because I'm a power efficient computing expert, I can put my batteries back in place while talking. Um, okay, uh, on the right hand side are the societal impacts. Uh, NSF funds a range of work that uh, dramatically changes communities in America and in the world. We do smart connected communities, we do different things around sort of climate resilient communities. And we're also changing the face of computing by funding a range of education and workforce investments that are designed to change how people enter into the computing curriculums in, in different schools and uh, how they are retained through CS workforce all the way through their lives. So that is us. Great. Uh, so this is another view of us. This is within the organization that I lead. What does the org chart look like? And I know org charts are boring, <laughs> but I want to show this for a few different reasons. First of all, the green and the two blues, those are the different sort of research division areas mapped out across, um, across our whole field. And you can see, uh, hopefully yourself, in some of the topic areas that are there. Uh, the upper left, the Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure is organizationally within size, but has this broader mission to serve the full scientific community with cyber infrastructure resources. So that's, yes, computer scientists, but it's also the astronomers that we talked about on the previous slide, and so on and so forth. Um, I also show this slide because you know, NSF is really trying to be a very approachable organization. If you have questions, if you have ideas about trees you want to plant, you can reach out to these folks. You can reach out to the program officers uh, who work in our organization, hundreds of them, and uh, hopefully get some guidance. Uh, but we're happy to draw and color across the lines when it makes sense. And so we have a range of directorate-wide initiatives, and we have a range of initiatives where we lead 
and all of NSF is with us on the parade. So things like secure and trustworthy cyberspace that many of you may contribute to, uh, that's an example of an NSF-wide program that, uh, that we lead. Uh, the National AI Research Institutes I'll talk about more later as well. By the numbers, uh, this slide pretty much says it all. As was mentioned, our budget is just over a billion dollars. These numbers are for fiscal year 21, which is the last complete fiscal year that we have. Uh, FY22 will end in the end of September. Uh, so just over a billion dollars in budget and around 7,000 proposals come in the door. And uh, thanks to many of you, we review them with a peer review process and we are able to make awards to about a quarter of them. We'd love for that to be higher. We, uh, we in many years have declined over a billion dollars of highly rated awards. Um, and that's just a, an opportunity cost that uh, should keep a lot of us up at night. Um, in terms of the numbers of what gets funded, I think one of the numbers that surprises a lot of people is our funding in size goes out to 373 institutions. So in America, we have this notion of Carnegie R1, or the most research intensive universities. There are about 150 R1 universities in America. And size essentially funds all of those. And then 220 more schools. So that's undergrad institutions, that's community colleges, that's a whole range of an ecosystem out there that goes way beyond uh, the R1s. Uh, and through that ecosystem, we fund about 20,000 people uh, from professors to grad students to undergrads. Uh, we fund in all 50 states and three territories, and we fund to over 70 minority-serving institutions. Uh, upshot of all of this is that NSF as a whole, and the size directorate in particular, fund around 80% of the federally funded CS that happens in the US at academic institutions. So I sometimes like to joke that if you're out in the audience and you're at an American university, there's a good chance I pay your salary, at least a teeny bit of it. Uh, so thank you for all you're doing. In terms of the technical ideas that we try to shape uh, within size, we think about them in terms of three organizational umbrellas. And these aren't intended to be narrow pathways for the community to kind of stay on like a balance beam. These are intended to be broad organizational umbrellas that reflect the inflection points we're seeing as a field and as a society. Uh, and I'll talk about each of these a little more in the slides that follow. But the first one is sort of navigating this seismic shift. And yes, if you work at a place called size, there's a little pun there. Uh, navigating the seismic shift that we're all seeing at the end of Moore's Law. The second one is about uh, the, the inflection points that we're seeing as, as AI sort of matures out of many different size topic areas and impacts society. And the third one is about the call for us to consider and design beneficial socio-technical systems. So on the first of these, uh, in an upshot, you know, the end of Moore's Law and Denard scaling, uh, or at least the slowing of Moore's Law, uh, impacts all aspects of computing. And I, I think I, I've been around long enough to remember when we shifted, say, from bipolar uh, transistors to CMOS transistors, and probably uh, many folks who were up higher in the software stack were completely unaware that that shift was going on because there were abstraction layers that meant you didn't need to know or care. Um, but we've lost the ability to rely on abstraction layers this time, these shifts are affecting the whole system stack. You guys know that already. And so it's about working as a full community to see what's next. It's also about thinking about maybe at the same time, it's a chance to reinvent some things. So for example, the traditional instruction set architecture abstractions that formed the hardware so software contract for a long time, um, they are very serviceable, but they didn't do the best job that they could on things like uh, security and reliability. We could do better there. And uh, we saw examples like Spectre and Meltdown where our inability to really uh, sort of navigate what was happening at that hardware software interface for real really affected our ability to, to ensure the security of systems. You can come up with other examples now around portability. Uh, increasingly, we're seeing so many accelerators on chips that the notion of uh, the old hardware software contracts are really out of date. Um, AI, digging in a little bit more, AI today draws from an all of size inflection point. And so AI algorithms, great, but it shouldn't be like AI is one part of the world and systems is another part of the world. 
AI is where it is because of systems, right? Uh, building the systems that have let AI scale. Um, and likewise, AI is broadly fueling advances across many aspects of our field. And so it really is transcendent in sort of permeating many aspects of what all of us do, as opposed to being kind of this thing off on the side. Um, third one, designing beneficial socio-technical systems, digging in a little bit more there. Uh, we've always been a socio-technical field. Think about our roots uh, decades ago. Uh, we, a lot of early American computing was in designing uh, devices to do missile trajectories. That's pretty socio-technical, right? So we should acknowledge that we have always been socio-technical, but now it's harder and harder to opt out, right? And so we need to think as systems designers and as computer scientists and as humans about what are the ethics and the implications of what we do and how can we steer the work we do in order to increase benefits and put guardrails on some of the concerns. And this is super broad, right? So for some folks, this might be um, about fairness in AI, but for other folks, this might be about ensuring better and more affordable connectivity across the whole world. Uh, so there's different ways that this tagline of beneficial socio-technical systems can come in. I wanted to talk about a few programs, not that you'll all be sort of writing proposals in the next five days to all of them, uh, but to give examples of the breadth of things that we work on both within size and across NSF. So one example of a new program, and it speaks to the first of those inflection points, the, the seismic shift at the end of Moore's Law, is a program that is NSF-wide called Future of Semiconductors or FUSE. Uh, deadline in five days if you're feeling perky tonight. Um, <laughs> and the idea here is to acknowledge this sort of uh, multi-topic uh, impact that the end of Moore's Law is having and to encourage co-design across different topic areas. So this is about getting computer systems folks working with uh, computer hardware folks, working with materials folks to think about co-design um, how might different CMOS plus X, how might different photonics technologies, how might different DNA st storage technologies impact systems design in a way that we can team up around and work on together. And so the first set of so-called teaming grants, um, that's the deadline in five days. And then we aspire to have sort of larger grants available in future fiscal years. Um, and we're also working on industry partnerships towards this as well. Second thing is about uh, transcendence of AI. Uh, I think I went through some of this, so I'll sort of speed up. Uh, what's next? You know, I, I think what I always like to say is uh, that your community plays a strong role in navigating this transition, and I say that to every community, for full disclosure. So, um, you know, we all are going to play a strong role in navigating the transition and in thinking about safety, security, robustness, and so forth of AI systems. I think the systems community and the ATC community you guys are rock stars at thinking about this uh, across many different dimensions of what we do, and so it's time to bring that into to AI um, even more so. Uh, vision. So uh, we, within NSF, we are starting to call this the bubble chart. Uh, so NSF started funding about two years ago, the National AI Research Institutes. So these are a network now of 18 different large-scale uh, investments that NSF has made. Each investment is $20 million over five years. It's led by one university with about 10 other universities as funded partners and a bunch of different industry uh, collaborators as well. So each AI Institute is one of these sort of red solar systems that you see here. There are 18 of those AI Institutes now with a funded footprint in 40 states. So this is big and it's happened pretty quickly just in a couple of years. And we're working on making the funding towards uh, the next uh, round of these AI Institutes. So there will be more of these red solar systems. But if you think about them as kind of a, 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 a network, uh, then this bubble chart is about building out the rest around that. So how do you connect those to the systems community to other AI researchers, and uh, how do you sort of pull in the broadest uh, cross-section of workforce into this area? That's what this network of networks vision is about. Uh, so one of the things that we just funded, I think this week, is the big blue oval, a so-called virtual organization that's intended to get all of those 18 AI institutes 
uh, at literally, I think it's over 100 universities in 40 states to talk to each other frequently in order to kind of build up a, a full community around them. So that's funded um, and in place. Uh, so the red, the red blobs exist and more red blobs are coming. The blue oval exists and more is coming. This notion of MSI ERI connectors, sorry, that's a, a lot of acronyms, but uh, it's uh, minority serving institutions are in the US, a category of institutions um, with uh, high minority populations and a, and a desire to make sure that we reach out to those communities effectively. And so we're looking at different mechanisms to connect them better into these AI Institute efforts. Uh, in addition, NSF has a new directorate, uh, a counterpart directorate called Technology Innovation and Partnerships, or the TIP directorate. It was announced in March. And this new directorate is working on regional uh, innovation engines and different sort of economic uh, aspects of what comes out of American labs. And so uh, we're working with the TIP directorate on different uh, efforts there. The last part of this diagram are the international AI partnerships. And uh, we have a set of efforts there as well. Uh, so one of those efforts uh, in, in NSF speak, we put out dear colleague letters or DCLs when we want the community to know about something. So the upper uh, right DCL was a set of uh, opportunities for these AI institutes, these red blobs, to collaborate internationally. And we're now in the process of having reviewed um, a, a couple dozen of those proposals, and we're making uh, funding awards to let each one of these AI institutes essentially collaborate internationally as they've proposed. And so you'll see those coming out over the next month or two. Uh, lower left is an opportunity that we'd love to actually see more folks come in on, because um, we put it out there in December, and we're waiting for it to pick up steam. And that is, I realize that is not an effective or catchy title. Um, <laughs> special guidelines, blah, blah, blah. OK, what is that? That is, if you're in the US, and your collaborators in Canada, and you work in areas that are broadly AI and quantum, but that can include systems aspects of either AI or quantum, you can write a proposal. You write a single proposal together. You submit it, the US, it, it goes through a single review process. The US person, if funded, gets funded out of NSF funds. The Canadian person, if funded, gets funded out of Canadian funds. So this is an opportunity long overdue, in my opinion, for US and Canadian researchers to work together. It happens to be around AI and quantum right now, but I think there's an awful lot of sort of breadth to how that gets viewed. And we haven't seen as many proposals into that as we expected. So. That's both about kind of AI, but also about these international opportunities. And I'll talk more about them as, as this talk proceeds. Uh, designing beneficial socio-technical systems. As I said, many things to many people. Tons of things related to the, the OSDI and ATC community. Um, the picture there is from a connectivity award that was made about uh, close to five years ago now. Uh, there's obviously tremendous range in how this gets viewed. Uh, it's core systems research to use inspired, it's cyber physical, it's networking, um, it's fairness, it's AI. And in general, it's about giving our research community the opportunity to, to reshape what we do in order to sort of put the societal benefits up front um, and bake in these notions of uh, sort of fairness, trust, and security throughout. One example of a place where I think there are tremendous, uh, tremendous opportunities in terms of beneficial socio-technical systems is about the role of computing and our whole community in sustainability and climate issues, which are sort of a grand challenge for us as a planet, right? Um, so I talk about this with these two arrows. I talk about this as a bi-directional set of topics. On the left is about us cleaning up our own house. It's about making computing itself more sustainable. And there's an awful lot of work through your community already that has done this. Um, I, I think, you know, as I, I sort of have done power efficient computing in the past, and one of the things I love about NSF is when uh, 
program officers call you on it and they say, yeah, Margaret, power efficiency is a part of it, but it isn't the only thing, right? Uh, the full life cycle of sustainability is way beyond power efficiency. It's into e-waste, it's into the energy required for the design and fabrication process of our computing systems. Um, so that's the left, and we can certainly work on that, focus on that. NSF has had um, programs specifically on that. We've had a DCL, Dear Colleague Letter, inviting proposals on that. You can see the URL down at the bottom. So there's a bunch of places in which we're working on this. Um, we actually have one partnership with VMware, so thank you to VMware. I know there's VMware folks in the house. It's specifically on sustainable digital infrastructure. So that's the left to right arrow. Uh, the right to left arrow is about the, the countervailing, which is let's use the computing we have to, to work on sustainability. So as a driver for computational modeling, adaptation and mitigation, um, we have programs like the Civic Innovation Challenge, um, which is a program that invites communities, regions, not research communities, towns, to come forward with their problems, many of which have to do with mitigating natural hazards, like extreme weather events, flooding, and so forth, um, and to bring their researcher friends with them. But it's framed as communities first and strong community engagement. So if you have ideas for work where you want to do systems work in the context of a, an actual community benefiting, uh, check out Civic Innovation Challenge and the other ones here as well. So we go both directions, and there's a huge opportunity space here and a huge need. So those were the three technical themes. I wanted to talk a little bit about some cross-cutting themes as well. And I should say that some fraction of you might actually be US academic researchers who could sit down tonight and write a proposal. Some fraction of you might be students who could encourage your professor to sit down and write a proposal. But others of you are from elsewhere in the world or from industry. And so for you, this isn't so much about this DCL or that solicitation, but it is about starting a conversation about what is needed for our field and where we ought to be going. And I'm happy to feel during Q&A other ideas you have about that. So back to this. Uh, so three technical themes, but really there's a bunch of cross-cutting themes that cut across this. And I'm gonna talk about two of them today that I think ought to be very near and dear to the hearts of many po folks in this room. So one is about research resources and infrastructure, and the other is about people. Uh, so research resources and infrastructure first. First and foremost, you know, I can remember, it was just three years ago, I was in a, it was before I was at NSF, and I was in a meeting, I won't say where, and someone said, well, well this computing research doesn't need infrastructure, we're all on our laptops, that's all we need. And I was like, are you kidding me? Um, so, I want to take those three themes and I want to talk about what researchers need to actually make headway on those themes. So, for the post more, you know, we need more access to semiconductor fab facilities. Most of our hardware work is being done in simulation, and that's not good. Uh, we need more experiential learning for our students, we need more experiential learning for our faculty, and um, parts of uh, U.S. federal funding have been okay about getting folks to access to fab facilities. DARPA, I think, has been a good leader in that. That's another, our sister agency. Um, but NSF has not traditionally helped its researchers fab things, and we need to do better on that. Um, we also are working hard on things like access to cutting-edge next-generation technologies, access to cloud uh, computing, cloud-connected quantum computing systems is one example there. AI. Uh, we hear from AI researchers all the time that they don't have the resources they need to do their research at scale in academia. And so what do we see? Uh, one thing we see is uh, a brain drain out to industry and out to other places where there's more data available and more compute cycles available. And we need to turn that around. Um, and, and so one of the things I want to stop and highlight here is the degree to which data is infrastructure for our community and so thinking about how to store data, how to federate data, and how to make it available to a broad set of researchers is really important. And then on the socio-technical systems, really thinking about communities as living labs, uh, thinking about what are the different sensing and connectivity platforms that we could make available to the community to, uh, to broadly allow people to work on this. And so the, the way I view this is some of you might have some of this. Many of you probably don't have enough of this. 
And there's folks who aren't at this conference today who don't really know that they have access to any of this. And it's our job at NSF to make things broadly available. Remember that 373 universities. That's beyond the folks in this room and, and then some. So the next few slides are really a menu of things that we do fund, we do offer, and uh, a plea to please use them. Uh, know that they are essentially an extension of your own lab facilities and they're available for you. So one example is the Platforms for Advanced Wireless Research or Power Test Beds. These are intended to enable at scale experimentation. There's four of them now. Uh, you can see them listed there. Uh, this is a $100 million public-private partnership. So this is NSF leading, um, but the Department of Defense, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and 35 companies are providing in-kind resources. So if you are curious about doing at-scale um, MIMO experiments or edge-to-cloud experiments, uh, powder might be a part of your experimental infrastructure. And I will say that these four test bids are available to uh, academics worldwide. So if you're in the US, great. But if you're international, these are also available to you. Uh, on the far right is the newest power test bed, uh, which is about affordable rural broadband is being stood up by uh, Iowa State University. Uh, so this is one, advancedwireless.org is where you can find out more information about uh, getting involved in using these. Uh, this is my happily jumbled crowded diagram. And I say happily, because if it weren't crowded, that would mean we didn't have as many resources. So the crowding is a good thing. Um, what are these? These are the different NSF-funded research resources and test beds. The green that you see, the sort of lime green, are those power test beds that I already mentioned uh, in Salt Lake, in Iowa, and so forth. So I already talked about them. The uh, gray down here, Frontera, that's the largest supercomputer on a US academic campus. It may be the largest supercomputer on any academic campus. I, I lose track of whether that's still a true statement. Uh, Frontera contributed about 60 million cycles towards that black hole image that you saw um, at the beginning of my talk. And Frontera also contributed uh, more resources than any other machine on Earth to the COVID-19 HPC consortium that was a public-private international partnership stood up to lend compute resources to what we were going through over the past two and a half years. So that's great. Um, I wanna focus in particular on three things uh, that are in red here, and that when I told people at NSF that I was going to ATC and OSDI, they said, oh, you need to talk about these three. And so this is partly to say thank you, and it's also partly to say, hey, you guys need to use this more. Uh, so these are the different cloud resources that are part of our funded portfolio. And so Chameleon Lab and Cloud Lab, I want to say thank you. The, the PIs have published about them here at these conferences. And I believe that OSDI has used them for artifact evaluation as well. And so thank you. These are essentially infrastructure. They're test beds that let researchers have bare metal access to, to cloud uh, experimentation platforms that let you do your work um, in a way that is uh, out in the cloud and yet uh, gives you more sort of direct control over the systems than if you just use the commercial cloud. So thank you to the PIs who stood those up. Um, but we could still use more users. It would be great to see more and more of the systems conferences where the work was done on these platforms. And so the two URLs in the middle and on the right at the bottom are how to learn more about those platforms. Uh, the third one, Cloud Bank, and, and I recognize that there's a lot of different names <laughs> and they're fairly similar, but Cloud Bank is not about bare metal access. Cloud Bank is about essentially being a front door to the commercial cloud. Uh, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, and, and so on and so forth. And so Cloud Bank is a, is a system in which uh, US researchers can get cloud credits as part of writing a proposal and then those cloud credits go straight to their cloud bank account. And then your students can use those commercial cloud resources um, as they normally would, uh, but essentially at a discount uh, because there's no indirect cost in the way the, the resources move around. Cloud bank is about three, four years old now. Um, it saw relatively slow uptake 
Um, and we think it's because you had to ask for those resources when you wrote a proposal. And then who really thinks about their cloud resources three years in advance? That's not what the cloud is about, right? So in the past six months, we've actually changed Cloud Bank so that you can ask for these uh, supplements essentially whenever you want. So you should use Cloud Bank. Uh, it's in various size solicitations. Uh, I know that when we put out a solicitation, the typical proposer reads maybe the first page. You read to uh, the deadline, the budget amount, and how many of these things you're allowed to submit. Uh, there's another 10 pages after that that no one ever reads. But I, I promise you that Cloud Bank is in a bunch of that text that you never read. Um, so it's there. Uh, as I said, there's no indirect cost. So if you are typically, as an academic, paying with a credit card for your students to use commercial cloud, you are often paying out of an account that is charging you indirect cost. And so if you use this Cloud Bank approach, you're probably going to save half. Um, and it's now more nimble than ever. The Cloud Bank supplement DCL is the link there. And you can request Cloud Bank credits essentially anytime you want. Um, so try it. It's actually seen a huge uptick in the four months since we put out this DCL. Great. People. Uh, we don't go anywhere without people. And um, this is so important for what we do. And I, I think I want to stop here and I want to say, you know, uh, here's my quiz question. I sometimes put the graph actually into my talk. Um, but my quiz question to you folks is, when do you think was the peak percentage of women receiving undergraduate degrees in uh, computing in America? So you might think that the peak percentage is basically right now. Uh, maybe it's been going up, up, up. You might be an optimist and think you know, it's at least going up, and so the peak would be now. You might have some other opinion. Um, I usually stop here, and I don't know how far back you can see my gray hair. Uh, <laughs> but for those of you in the back, I am 58 years old, and I have gray hair, and I am your peak. The peak was 1985. I got my college degree in 1986. Uh, it was around 30% women back then. It dropped precipitously. Uh, it's coming back up. It hasn't hit that peak again yet. I would love to leave NSF having surpassed that peak. Um, but even if we did, there's a whole bunch of other ways in which we need to think about our field's inclusion in terms of uh, how we retain folks in the field, how we uh, sort of create a welcoming community, how we think about many different dimensions to who we are, whether it's uh, demographic information, socioeconomic status, uh, geographic inclusion, and so forth. Uh, and so this is about that, not because I'm a woman speaker and I want more women in computing, but because there's a whole lot of ways in which we aren't going to move on these societal challenges if we're only taking about 30% of the world's talent uh, with us on this journey, right? And so um, that's what this is about. This is about being able to do the best science by taking the full set of talents with us on this journey. So what NSF uh, envisioned about 12 years ago and has implemented over the past five years is uh, a new effort to ask that everyone who submits to size, uh, everyone who submits size proposals at the level of 600K or more actually actively engages with us in broadening participation in computing. And in particular, uh, we require every proposer, we call them PIs, to offer a broadening participation in computing plan or a BPC plan uh, for proposals into our topic areas. And the idea is if, if we need everyone involved, if we need everyone to move the needle, then we need to engage everyone in the, in the practice of doing that broadening. Um, but we know that if we ask 20,000 PIs to submit proposals with BPC plans without any coordination, we might get some great ideas, but it would be kind of a jumble. And so uh, what we have sought to do is to align ideas better and to offer those who feel like they don't have full expertise on these kinds of efforts 
a little bit of scaffolding and help. And so in particular, uh, our goal is to have a set of department and campus level resources and a set of national level resources so that individual PIs aren't just on their own talking about BPC, but rather individual researchers are plugging into something bigger than themselves, either on their campus or nationally. And so what NSF has done is fund that scaffolding. Uh, so we require the plans and then we fund the scaffolding to help people feel like their plans can be effective. Uh, so bpcnet.org is uh, a URL, you can go check it out. It has a menu of things that you could do to broaden participation in computing yourself or with your colleagues or with your campus. It also has a set of people who, it floors me, they volunteer their time to help you make a better BPC plan through consulting office hours, through workshops that help departments think about what a campus BPC plan should look like, and so forth. And you have tremendous opportunities to tailor these to your local context. Every campus is different, every department is different. Uh, there's ways to, to, to tailor as you see fit. So this has been going on now as first a pilot for three years and now as a, as a full-fledged, we, we took the word pilot off of it, it's simply something we ask for. Um, and we're watching the community get better and better at actually writing BPC plans that are meaningful and then acting on them. Uh, when I showed my slides to someone, they said, you need to say that there's money involved, there's money available. And so just like uh, you can ask for cloud bank money anytime you want, uh, we want you to know that you can ask for BPC money essentially anytime you want. Uh, there's a lot of words on this slide, but I will just say that uh, feel free to uh, go to that 21-571 or go to your program officer for more information. If you have ideas for something that you started out as part of a BP plan and now you want to scale it up, we want to help you and this is how we can. More, uh, just in case your summer looked a little too open, uh, more opportunities. Uh, Q is computing undergrad education. You might say, I don't teach that intro programming class. I don't, this is not for me. Um, but what we're hearing is that there's an awful lot of people who are worried that our curricula are not keeping up with our technology trends. And a big place where people are worried about that is cloud computing, cloud programming. Uh, and that is totally the ATC OSDI wheelhouse, right? So uh, we hear from industry that folks come out of CS departments not having had enough or broad enough or rigorous enough experience in cloud programming. And one of the things that Q can let you do is to take the time and the effort to rethink what your cloud computing curricula looks like within your department. Um, and so we encourage you to take a look and uh, take a look at that. It also asks you to think about things like teams of schools working together so that once you take this effort to redo some part of your curricula, it has some scale impact beyond your own campus. Uh, it asks for you to think about things like ethics in competing ethics and curricula as well. Uh, CS grad for US, deadline closed on June 30th. So one of the things that we see in the US is we have booming enrollments at the undergrad level, uh, but most of the folks who are undergrads in CS in America don't uh, continue immediately or ever into advanced degree programs. And to some degree, that's awesome. It means there's great job opportunities out there and they're going for it, that's great. Um, but we're worried about who's going to be the next generation of PhD level researchers in our field, whether in academia or elsewhere. And so the goal of this is to increase the number and diversity of folks, US citizen and permanent resident graduate students in computing fields. So this is the second time that we've offered this fellowship program. We offered it a year ago. Um, and we frankly got them, we were worried that we would get so many responses that we wouldn't know what to do. If 50,000 students graduate a year, um, we were worried they would all apply. Uh, they didn't all apply. <laughs> um, did it again this year, got double the applicants this year, so that's great. But they, still, the numbers are quite low relative to the need and relative to the opportunity. So for those of you who are familiar, this is the same funding level as a quote unquote NSF graduate fellowship, so three years of full funding. Uh, what's distinct about it is twofold. Number one, it comes with a year of mentoring before you start graduate school to help you know what graduate school is and uh, to help you with your grad application. Um, and it comes with uh, a hope that we're going to pull folks from 
uh, industry back to, back to advanced degree programs. So it's asking for folks who have graduated 2021 or earlier to come back into the academic pathways. One more. So about five years ago, uh, in the heart of the Me Too movement, um, NSF changed how we give out awards. And in particular, NSF added uh, what's called a terms and condition that goes out with every award that we make. If you get a dollar from NSF, it has this term and condition associated with it, which is that your university needs to let NSF know uh, if, if something has happened uh, that has put a researcher on administrative leave um, related to uh, harassment of different types. Um, in essence, we know that it's not enough to recruit people into the field. Uh, we need to make sure that it's safe for them to stay and productive for them to stay. And we don't want our scarce dollars going to fund um, different kinds of power dynamics and harassment. Uh, so we put this in place five years ago, and it's not the most fun part of my job, uh, but I have watched it happen. I have watched this kick in in different moments, and I'm glad it exists uh, because we need to make sure that it's safe for our students and for our early career faculty and, frankly, for people at all seniority levels to do their best science because it's not enough to recruit. We also need to retain. We need to cultivate careers. So um, this was NSF's step about five years ago. I know that there's a lot of different efforts that are going on within the community. I know that one effort is getting kicked off here, uh, a survey related to, to harassment, and I would encourage you all to find out the URL for that survey and fill it out. Uh, I'm not allowed to say that um, as a federal employee, but I'm just saying that as Margaret. Find the survey and fill it out. Great. Uh, slight shift in gears. I'm going to talk about some different international uh, places where NSF has played a role. So I mentioned this before, I'll mention it again. Uh, to be at NSF in March 2020 was really some of the most remarkable weeks of my life. Uh, to watch a scientific community ramp up efforts to help a global challenge. And one of the things that NSF did in March 2020 was co-lead with IBM and the US Department of Energy an international public-private consortium to say, hey, computing resources will probably help us understand SARS-CoV-2, so let's get them out there for scientists to use. Um, as this progressed, uh, we ended up with 40 consortium members around the world, 136,000 compute nodes available. Uh, NSF was the primary contributor of resources. Uh, the, the, um, 2020 and 2021 Gordon Bell Prizes uh, in the COVID-19 special Gordon Bell Prize area, both uh, received compute resources out of this consortium. So this is one example where it's pretty amazing to be a part of something that can sort of spin up efforts at this level. I'm gonna skip some of this. I, I wanted to talk about some international partnership examples just to give a sense of what we do with our sister agencies around the world. Uh, so one international example on a particular topic area is called Collaborative Research in Computational Neuroscience, or CRCNS. NSF leads uh, a many country effort around this topic area that has been extraordinarily effective at bringing together researchers. So when this started, uh, I am told, that neuroscientists basically didn't talk to computing people at all. They were two separate worlds. And so the goal was to bring compute and neuroscience together. In the process, we brought a lot of countries together, and you can see the full list there. Um, and it's now at the point where over half of the proposals that we receive into this program at NSF have an international collaboration component associated with them. Another long-term effort of this sort is Wi-Fi US, uh, Finland and the US, uh, collaborating for over 10 years on a range of wireless networking and IoT research. And uh, we now have, just in the past month, uh, a humble web page. Web pages are not NSF's strong point, I'll admit that. Um, but we do have a humble web page that lists the different international opportunities 
And it's, it's something where there's a, a lot of effort on expanding that list and broadening that list. So if you have ideas or if you have experiences you want to relate, I'd be happy to hear about them. So with that, I'll end where I began. That um, it's, it's been extraordinary to kind of jump over to the other side and uh, see how a funding agency can help uh, get trees planted. Um, you guys have an awful lot of uh, acorns in your pocket, and our goal is to try to make sure that some of those acorns become oak trees. Uh, so with that, thanks very much, and I'd be happy to field some questions.